Namaste. All right, guys. Um, what I got for you today is, well, we're starting a completely different topic. All right. And today we're going to talk about gravity, which is, uh, it, it's an important topic, obviously, um, in physics, but just in, you know, it's part of your general education that every, you know, um, functional adult obviously, obviously ought to know a little bit about the force of gravity. <clears throat> and let's go into, let's, uh, let's go into why. Well, one, because you've evolved to be in the force of gravity. Okay. You would be very uncomfortable. Um, I know that um, people might think like, well, if I was out in space or if I was in orbit and I was in that free fall state where you're, you know, quote unquote weightless, uh, which you're not really, you're really in a free fall state, but um, it feels like your, your weight, your effective weight is actually zero when you're free falling um, because there's no normal force on you. But anyway, and people think, well, that would be fun. And, and I'm sure it would be fun for a while. But the reality is that it wouldn't be good for too long because your muscles tend to atrophy. All right. You are made, your body is made to carry its own weight um, and your heart is a muscle. So if you don't, um, if you're in a weightless environment for too long, um, you, we found that astronauts, um, they are in danger when they come back to earth because their muscles have atrophied and so has their heart, which is a muscle because your blood has weight, right? Because it's mainly made of water. You're mainly made of water. Water is actually kind of heavy. And so for your, your heart to pump that water or that blood throughout your system like that, if it, um, if suddenly that water becomes lighter, uh, your heart, uh, doesn't work as hard, and then it atrophies, it gets weaker, and then when you come back down to Earth, now you have some problems, all right? And that has happened with astronauts in the past. You can only spend so much time out in orbit before it, it actually becomes dangerous for when you come back down to uh, to the surface. So we all kind of need gravity, all right? Um, it, we're comfortable in it, all right? We've evolved to be comfortable in it. Um, okay, so it was figured out by Isaac Newton. I mean, obviously it was just, you know, it was known to human beings as long as we've been around. Why? <clears throat> because, well, let's take a look at this slide right here. Why? Because we all get an education in this when we're about a year old. All right. Um, we start to walk, we start to struggle up against gravity and stand on our two legs. And basically the art or the act of walking is the act of, uh, keeping your center of mass above the ground and um, and not allowing gravity to act on it. And so you would fall. We know, and I like this picture here, those of you guys taking the psychology class here, we know that we have an instinctive knowledge of what gravity can do to us. All right. We know that a fall can hurt us. Here's the <clears throat> famous experiment psychological experiment where they would take infants and they put them on like this table here and then they put like a big thick piece of glass all right um that the was is obviously strong enough to hold the in, infant and they would put the mom here and say come you know and the mom would try and call the baby and at uh initially when the baby's like really young the uh, the infant will just walk right over the glass. But at a certain point, the instinct in the baby's brain kicks in and the baby sees the fall through the glass, th sees the drop and the depth and, um, and won't cross it. Why? Because the child has an instinctive knowledge of just what gravity can do to you. All right. So and we're all like that. OK, um, um, I owe you a cape helps. All right. Come on. Every single one of you guys has tried this. Just saying. All right. Especially Gianna Truppi. All right. Um, OK, what what actually is it? And it's the reality is this is one of those places in science where we have to admit our ignorance. It's a force. But we don't know we don't know how it's made. We don't know how the universe makes gravity. We know that it has something to do with this stuff called mass, which we're not really sure what mass is really. Um, and mass, <clears throat> what it does, what masses do is they create all masses create gravity. Okay, um, but. Obviously, it's it's such a weak forced gravity is that it's only really felt when you're around very massive objects 
like obviously we're right on top of a planet, which compared to us is very massive. So stars create a significant amount of gravity. Planets create a significant amount of gravity. Obviously, whole galaxies, which are collections of billions of stars, all to get held together by gravity, creates massive gravitational fields around them. Um, so, you know, how is it? But how does mass actually make gravity? We absolutely have actually have no idea in the year in in you know the current year. So. Um, now, what Einstein said, and this is why I had you guys watch the Flatland video or um, and me telling you the story about Flatland, is Einstein says that what mass does is it bends the space around it. Now, that leads to some questions, okay? Um, because how do you bend empty space? What do you grab onto, all right, to bend it? But there's a significant amount of evidence to show that or to indicate that this actually is really what happens. All right. So let me go into the, the next slide. All right. So uh, oftentimes they show gravity as a like. So you have this object as if like space was like flat, like a flat sheet like this right here. And then here's like a sun or the star and it's uh, the star is bending the space around it. OK. Um, Okay, fine. Um, and so what winds up happening is the planet is trying to travel in actually a straight line, um, in a straight line, but it, the space that the planet is traveling through is actually curved. And then the planet winds up going in a circular path, kind of getting trapped in what, let me throw some language out here. Uh, out at you, what we would call the gravitational well created by the star. OK, and if you take a look at this diagram right here, the more mass it depends on mass, but it also depends on density. So the sun creates uh, bends the space around it and creates what's called a gravitational well. Uh, when the sun eventually starts to burn out and the fusion goes away uh, and the sun becomes kind of like this hot cinder, it shrinks because the sun actually is so massive, it has its own internal gravity that the sun, the, the mass of the, the sun's own mass is actually trying to crush it when the fusion um, explosions uh, eventually stop inside the sun or any star for that matter, the internal gravity of the sun makes it shrink. And the sun will end up as something called a white dwarf where it'll shrink down about size of uh, the earth itself. It will have most of its mass though. So it'll still be almost as massive as the sun is right now. Um, <clears throat> but it size will shrink. And so it'll get smaller and smaller for that mass. And what it'll do is it bends the space around it even more. Okay. Uh, a neutron star, which is um, a more massive star than the sun uh, winds up as something called a neutron star, which is even smaller. A uh, neutron star is the entire mass of a sun in about the size of the space of Manhattan Island, uh, does it even more. And then the very largest stars, they seem to like shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And we really don't even know what happens to them. It's very mysterious. And we call that object a black hole, where the matter itself that made up the star seems to like, I don't know, disappear. Uh, how does that happen? Where does it go? Good luck, because uh, nobody, nobody knows. Um, and and the, th the, the news is about it that, you know, in, in this current age, we don't even seem to be even close to having an, any real answer. But what it does do is create a, a very deep gravitational well that is so, where the space um, around uh, this area is so contorted that even light, when light gets within a certain distance called the event horizon, it doesn't come out and it just spiral, spirals in. There's the event horizon right there. And that's where you get a black hole um, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. OK, so um, and anyway, so how do we know this happens? Well, let me kind of let me kind of go through these slides in a little bit out of order. If you take a look at this right here, here's a picture that uh, it's called gravitational lensing. And here's how we know that Einstein seems to have been right, because astronomers see this all the time. So if you see, like, look at this bright spot right here. Now, this is a picture of deep space. And at this level of space, 
everything you're looking at is a galaxy, not a star, a galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of billions of stars. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars in it, maybe about 200 billion or so. Um, we're not really sure, but we estimate. And um, so they collectively, like this object right here is a galaxy of probably, you know, about you know, 200 billion stars or so. And that's it's super massive. So what this galaxy is doing is it's bending the space around it. And then you're looking at these little wispy things right there, circular like that. And you see almost like rings around this galaxy right there. Why? What's going on? And you see how they kind of ripple out like that. What this, what's actually happening in these rings, all right, what they are, are they're, they're the light from galaxies that are actually physically behind this galaxy right here. This galaxy is blocking other galaxies behind it. But why are we seeing light from galaxies behind this one that uh, that appears in these wispy kind of little rings? Well, let's go to this slide right here. Here's what's going on. OK, um, so here's a galaxy. Here's a they're using a cluster of galaxies, whatever, uh, that is distorting the space around them. And so what winds up happening is light, like from a light bulb, goes out in all direction from this particular galaxy right here. Oops. And um, what some of it inevitably, and here's us right here on Earth, and some of it inevitably, some rays of light will inevitably go close to this cluster of galaxies which is bending the space around it. And the light is trying to, is traveling straight, but the space that it's traveling through is curved. And so the light winds up curving and it winds up where this ray would normally not hit us. It does because it's traveling through some curved space here and it winds up angling and then we actually see it. But because the this system, this um, cluster of galaxies is bending space in all directions, some light from this galaxy here of, you know, eventually uh, or um, goes and uh, on the other side of this cluster and does the same thing. Some go straight through, uh, but some will go over the top and bend that way. And what you see is a ring, the light from here appearing to us as a ring-like effect because our eyes trace the rays of light straight back. And so we see this ring-like effect. And again, back to this slide, there you see it, okay? That's what's happening. This is light from a galaxy behind this one right here that is trying to, that is going straight because light always goes straight, but it is traveling through curved space. And again, very mysterious. How do you how do you curve space? No clue whatsoever. Uh, nobody has a clue whatsoever. Uh, not in not in the present day and age. All right. Um, what Isaac Newton noticed or came up with was his gravity equation, and he noticed that gravity seemed to depend on two things. The strength of a force of, um, of gravity depends on two things. Um, it depends on the two masses. All right. So if you have one planet and another planet, the bigger they are, the more gravity will there will be between them. And I know my subscripts came out kind of weird, but this is M1, M2. And R is the distance between the two masses. OK, so R um, and notice how that's a square. That's an inverse square law. And so uh, it's the force of gravity between two objects is directly proportional to the two masses, okay, and that um, the force is in between, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And Isaac Newton came um, up with this idea basically through astronomical observations of his day and age, and where they were starting to really get scientific about about charting the, the orbits of the planets. And through studying these, um, he came up with this equation. And then G here, this is big G. It's not little g, which is 9.8. That's little g, big G. This is called the gravitational constant, okay? And it is a true constant in nature as far as we know, okay? 
Um, G, little g, 9.8, is not a true constant in nature. That little g is nine, the acceleration due to gravity, and we always say like near the Earth's surface, only works from where we're sitting on the surface to about 200 miles up. And after about 200 miles up or so, it's not 9.8 anymore. It's something less than 9.8. Um, so, and it gets less and less. Why? Because gravity does start to get weaker. Okay, the farther you get away from the Earth, and um, and there you have that. Okay, so this is the gravitational equation. Okay, um, here are some of the notes on it. Notice um, here's a gravitational constant. Make sure you have that in your notes. Uh, notice is actually very small. It's ten to the negative eleventh. I don't even know what that number is. It's a billionth of a billionth of something. All right, it's uh, it's very very small number which is indicative of the fact that gravity is very weak. That's why even though you have mass and you create um, some gravity around you, when you walk next to someone, you don't feel the gravitational pull between you and whoever you're walking next to. Why? Because your masses are very big. The only time you feel it is when, because this number is so small, is when the masses are very large. Like when you have a planet, like when you have a star, like when you have a galaxy. That's when the F becomes significant because, again, this G number here, this gravitational constant, is really, really tiny. Okay, um, so I'll let you get those notes um, and pause the video as you need to. Make sure you're watching my videos. All right. Um, so uh, anyway, just make sure you're doing that. All right. Um, I'm skipping some slides there. Don't worry about it. Okay, let's talk about potential energy. Potential energy you were taught is MGH, all right? Um, near the Earth's surface, the H height is really small. Even if you are 200 miles above the Earth's surface, the radius of the Earth is 4,000 miles. Satellites in low orbit of 200 miles, 300 miles, 400 miles, they are barely above the planet. They are really, really, they're still on the Earth essentially. OK, so um, when you're even on a tall building, your H is still really pretty much the radius of the Earth. OK, um, because really the the gravity starts from the center of the planet. OK, that's where it's where it's really coming from the center of mass of the planet. So um, what winds up happening then is um, G now, let me go back and explain this, the second bullet. G is big G, M, E over R squared. Um, if you were to do this, like in here, and it says, if you were to, this is the equation I gave you for weight, M, G. Well, what is weight? Well, I told you earlier on, it's the force of gravity on you, the force of the Earth's gravity on you. Well, that means you could set that equal to this, okay, where this M right here would be, one of the m's here one would be the mass of the earth the other would be your mass and so on and that m would cancel with one of the m's over here leaving g little g as uh the gravitational constant times the mass of the earth and r would be the radius of the earth and sure enough it, it does work out if you take the gravitational constant multiply it by the mass of the earth Divide it by the, the radius of the planet Earth squared. You get the number 9.8. It actually works. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. Now back, fast forward to the potential energy slide. So G, 9.8, is actually big G, M, E over R, E squared, where R, E is the radius of the Earth. Um, when you put this into that, and have H as the radius of the Earth, you get potential energy, a different expression for potential energy um, of big G, your mass, the mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth. Notice one of the radii cancels out. Okay, this H, which is would be the radius of the Earth, cancels with one of the ones in the RE squared. And you get this expression for the potential for potential energy. Okay. Um, all right. So there you have it. 
A um, couple other things I want to discuss about mass, because again, we really don't know what mass is. You say, you're always taught when you're a kid in uh, the elementary school's teacher, teachers teach you that mass is the amount of stuff in an object. What is that stuff? We don't know. Um, if you could, at the very smallest level of existence, if you could see an electron, what is it? What would it feel like? What would it look like? We don't really know. Not that we could ever see something like that because light at that level is meaningless. Um, you can't actually see an electron. It's way too small. Pieces of light called photons are much bigger than electrons, so you could never see something like an electron. What would it be? We don't even know. Um, so we define mass in two ways. We say there's gravitational mass, which is how an object responds to gravity in accordance with this equation, okay? Um, and then we also say that there's something called an inertial mass, which is how an object responds to a force in accordance with Newton's second law. Suffice to say, when we try and measure an object's gravitational mass and its inertial mass, we have never as human beings detected any difference between the two definitions or the two different types of mass. They always measure out to be the exact same quantity for a given object. Okay. All right. Um, last thing you need to know um, is that gravity is what's called a fundamental force. All right. It is one of the, when we talked about forces, we talked about fundamental forces. It's the weakest of the three. Um, fundamental forces. And remember, fundamental forces are fundamental because they seem to be created when the universe created. They're in the universe. They exist in the universe, but we have no idea why they're here. We have no idea what makes gravity or how the universe makes it. We have no idea. That doesn't mean we're ignorant completely. We can calculate gravity. We have an idea that it comes from bent space-time. Um, but we, we have no idea how that happens. All right. Or, you know, um, or why? Same thing with the electroweak force and the strong nuclear force. These are fundamental forces because we don't really know why they exist or how the universe makes them. OK, so anyway, I'm going to end this video here. I'm going to do another supplemental one where I'm at the chalkboard. OK, make sure you guys are watching these things. And all right, goal us out.